Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's session, keynote session. My name is Dr. Rosanna Olson, and I'll be co-chairing this session with my colleague, Malar Chakravarti. It is my great pleasure to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Oli Jensen. Dr. Jensen is the professor of translational neuroscience and the co-director of the Center for Human Brain Health at the University of Birmingham. He is a world-leading expert on applying mag magnetoencephalography to study the human brain. In particular, his work is focused on uncovering the mechanistic role of neural oscillations in cognition. In 2002, he published one of the first papers to measure frontal lobe theta increases and show that they were related to working memory load. He's also well recognized for his theoretical and empirical work on the role of alpha oscillations in inhibition. Let's welcome Dr. Jensen. So thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to present uh, our work, uh, and also thanks for the very uh, kind uh, introduction. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is a pipelining mechanism for fast visual processing. So uh, in order to explain what that is about, I will set the stage by first pointing out a conundrum uh, in terms of visual processing. So as you probably all are aware, uh, that when we are viewing an image, our eyes are moving around over that image, right? So we are circulating around to explore what's on the visual scene. Nevertheless, um, a key point here is that our eyes typically land on informative part of that visual scene. So how come uh, we have the ability to have our eyes land on important parts of the visual scene without not knowing what is in that picture yet? Right? So that's sort of a conundrum. Another issue is that our eyes circate up every 250 milliseconds. So that doesn't really leave a lot of time for both exploring what we are fixating at, but also future circate goals. So just to make that really explicit, so uh, say here that we are focusing on one part of the visual scene, as you see here, then uh, while doing that, we need to also decide where to move our eyes next, right? And that has to be done within 250 milliseconds, but that's only one part of the issue. Also, after our eyes have moved to that new object, there might still be some sort of processing going on of the previous object that we just fixated that. It could be that it's not fully processed and still needs to be integrated into the whole processing stream. So, um, what we have been doing over the recent years is take some of the insight we have on visual processing uh, and then apply it to uh, reading. So of course, reading is very similar to visual processing in the sense that there are objects, that, in this case words, that need to be processed, and then also our eyes are moving from word to word, right? So also in this case, when we are doing um, sentence processing and reading, there's this element of um, identifying the word we are fixating at, but that also needs to be a preview uh, going on of upcoming word candidates in a sentence. So what is the evidence for this? Well, the evidence is that um, often when we read words are being skipped, in this case, the word the is being skipped because it's not very informative. But of course, in order to skip that word, uh, it has to be a previewed or, or, or there has to be some sort of peripheral processing going on. Okay, so while it's clear this is being done, the issue is also for reading that it must be completed each, uh, within 250 milliseconds, right? So again, when we read, our eyes jump from word to word, and uh, it, we, have, we have circadian at about three to four times per second. Uh, so the visual system is really pressed for time in order to do both visual exploration, but also reading. So I couldn't help, uh, okay, so just to, to be even more uh, specific about this, when we are fixating on the word um, OA in this case, both the and lazy needs to be uh, previewed in the periphobia, uh, such that a decision can be, be made on where to move the eyes next. But that's only one part of the issue. What we also need to do is to consider the post-processing in the sense that when we are fixating on OA, uh, jumped might not be fully processed yet, right? 
So again, the visual system is, is really pushed for time uh, because we have these 250 milliseconds available. So I couldn't help putting in these slides. So as you all are aware, when you see pigeons, for instance, walking around, they are bobbing their head, right? So wh why do they do that? Well, of course, that's because they need to keep the visual image stable as the body move forward, and then their head is shooting uh, uh, forward after that, right? But also, this head bobbing is going on at about uh, four times per second. So there seems to be something universal uh, across species in terms of visual processing and these time windows of, 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 of processing. Nevertheless, uh, what I'm going to do now is to uh, put forward a pipelining mechanism for how we think this processing might be going on. Uh, but before getting into that, I'll tell you some more data about uh, the, 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 the temporal constraints during visual processing. So uh, consider this picture here. Uh, uh, it could be that your eyes are moving first from, the, from the, the boy, then to the woman, then to the dog, right? So now consider that we are fixating on the woman, our eye lens on the woman here. Uh, then, of course, uh, this object is being processed in the ventral stream. Uh, so we know that uh, at around 80 milliseconds, feature processing is going on in V4. Slightly later, maybe at 150 milliseconds, uh, the object is being identified in object selective cortex. Uh, and then there's a bit of time left for doing the previewing and decide where to move the eyes next. Okay, so now let's look at this from the perspective of the motor system. So, If you view this from the perspective of the motor system, there's about 100 milliseconds uh, to, to sort of initiate the, the, and execute the circuit. We know that it's about the time frame for, for, for doing that. But that means that before that, a decision has to be made on where to move the eyes, right? So basically, when we look at this diagram, there seems not to be enough time both to process the object that you fixate at, but then also to preview where to move your eyes next. Uh, the same holds for when considering reading. So in this case, say that you are fixating on the word jumped, uh, then uh, jumped has to be processed uh, first in the visual word form area for the uh, orthography that could be completed at 80 milliseconds. And then uh, later there's the lexical lookup that, that could be in the occipital gyrus that might be completed at 150 milliseconds. And then there's the semantic processing of the word jumped. So there's some debate on when that is completed, but it could be at 200 milliseconds. And again, that leaves very little this, uh, time, if any, uh, for the visual system to process the upcoming words in the paraphobia, right? So what is going on here? Uh, so several ideas have been put forward. Uh, so one could consider a strictly serial model, right? Uh, so you might have heard about the model Easy Reader, which is serial in nature. However, um, what that model assumes is that each word are processed uh, at least at the lexical level uh, before the upcoming words is then uh, processed in the paraphobia. However, as I already pointed out, there's a big timing issue here, right? There simply does not seem to be enough time for serial processing in a sense that you have to complete the processing of the fixated word, but then also move your attention uh, to and make a decision on the upcoming word to read. Well, then you might argue, well, there's plenty of neurons in the brain, so maybe there's some sort of parallel processing going on, right? So it could be that jumped over and there are being processed in parallel, even though these words are in the respective uh, phobia and paraphobia. Uh, however, there's a problem about this strict uh, parallel processing uh, idea. And that is, that there is, of course, the hierarchy in the visual system in the ventral stream, right? So uh, this hierarchy then also implies that we have, you have larger and larger receptive fields, and um, you have these larger and larger, uh, uh, you have these more and more complex representations down the ventral stream. So uh, this implies that there's some sort of congestion going on in, in the ventral stream, right? And this congestion makes it difficult to entertain um, a fully parallel processing idea. Um, so there's one way around this, uh, and that it is if you 
assume very sparse codes of the representations down the ventral stream, uh, but also that notion has problems and that we can discuss later. Okay, so in order to uh, overcome this problem of uh, the fast processing in the ventral stream, what we have been putting forward is an idea on pipelining. So how to understand that? So here's an example of a couple and they are washing dishes, right? So of course, what the girl is doing, she's picking up a dish, she's uh, washing it, and then she's passing it to the guy who is drying it. So while the guy is drying that dish, the girl can put, pick up the next dish and so forth, right? So uh, this is basically what we mean by uh, uh, pipelining, in a sense that uh, these two people are working in parallel, but uh, they are operating at different levels of the processing hierarchy, right? So there are some parallel processing going on, but it is going on at different levels uh, of, of the hierarchy. Uh, furthermore, there is serial processing going on if you view this at the perspective of the plate, it's being passed from one person to the next. So uh, we now imagine something similar could be going on in the ventral stream. So again, look at the example here, you have jumped, Jumped is being processed in the visual word form area first, and then it moves down the ventral stream to the uh, occipital gyrus for the lexical lookup, and then to the anterior temporal lobe for the semantic uh, processing, if you will. Okay, so the key point here is that when jumped is moving from the visual word form area to the processing in the middle occipital gyrus, that leaves resources open for the processing in the visual word form area of the next word over, right? So uh, now, next step when jump is moving forward to the anterior temporal lobe and over can then be processed for lexical information that leaves open for the to be processed, right? So, so these words are shifting through the visual hierarchy and this is achieved by this uh, pipelining mechanism. Uh, so this is a different way of showing exactly the same, right? So we have the visual hierarchy where orthography, lexical and semantic information is being processed. Jump is moving down the hierarchy. So when jump move on uh, from orthography to lexical processing, that leaves open for the next word over to be processed uh, and, and so forth, right? And a little later, the word is move, the, the eyes are moving to the word over and then the whole thing starts um, uh, starts again with respect to the next set of words, right? So this is the pipelining mechanism in a nutshell that we currently are investigating. So, um, so far this is just pure speculation and what we are trying now is to find evidence for, for a mechanism like this. And um, we, we have some early evidence for this uh, and this is work by Dong Wei Li, a, a very talented uh, a PhD student in my group. And what we came up with uh, was a paradigm where we are trying to investigate uh, this mechanism of um, parallel processing going on at different levels in the visual hierarchy. Uh, and to do so, uh, we have uh, a, a simple task in which two words are being presented, in this case, lion and apple, right? So what we ask people to do is first to fixate on the word to the left and then lion and apple are being presented, and then people by their own volition are moving the eyes first to lion and then to apple, right? So I should say we do this uh, study with MEG and we do it with an eye tracker, um, so we allow people to do saccades. So traditionally people have been a bit uh, afraid of doing a task with saccades using MEG and EG, uh, uh, simply because you get some artifacts when there are eye movements but hopefully I can convince you that these eye movements are not a major problem uh, when we are um, analyzing these data, in this case with, with multivariate analysis. So I should also say we had a, a little task in which we were probing uh, the participants for whether they actually perceive the color of the presented words and also the category of these words. Okay, so this is the task itself. So uh, we had about 30 subjects performing this task and we recorded their brain data with MEG and of course also had the eye tracker going. And the key point here is that we are then using um, a support vector machine to try to uh, dis discriminate uh, in the brain activity when, uh, for instance, uh, the, the color was being processed uh, for, for the fixated word, right? So it could be that we are fixating on apple 
and then using the decoder, we are trying to look at the time course of the brain activity, reflecting when uh, um, uh, the, the color blue versus red can be decoded. I should say we actually had four colors here, so actually what we are decoding is blue versus the three other colors, right? So this is decoding at the feature level. But uh, what we also had was four categories of the words. Um, in this case, here we are comparing animals versus fruits. But then we can also decode the category uh, uh, information of these words based on the brain activity. Okay, so moving on. Uh, this is basically the data for this study. So uh, what you should now uh, consider is that the participants are moving the eyes and fixating on the word apple at, at, uh, and this is at time zero milliseconds. Uh, so what we then can see in the data is that people are actually, uh, we, we, we can decode the information of the previous word lion when people are fixating on apple, right? So this is post-processing. So when people are moving the eyes to, in this case, apple, there's still semantic information lingering on uh, regarding the representations of the previous word, in this case, lion. The key point here is that we can now also decode the feature of the fixated word apple, right? So that's red versus blue. And it turns out that at about 100, 120 milliseconds, we can decode the, the feature of the apple. That is at the same time period in which we could decode the category of the previous word uh, being animal versus fruit, right? So uh, what we then like to argue here is that we have some support for the pipelining idea in a sense that we can decode both feature of the fixated word while we can decode cat category of the previous word, right? So um, we have some sort of parallel processing going on, but the system is working uh, at, at different levels of the hierarchy for, for, with respect to word one and word two. Okay. So that, that was sort of the parallel element uh, uh, related to the pipelining. Uh, with respect to the serial element, uh, what we can now do is to look at the category decoding for the fixated uh, word one, uh, word two, but also the previous word lion, right? So again, that's what you see here. People are fixating on the word apple. Uh, so when doing that, as I mentioned before, we can decode the category of the previous word lion, as you see here on the left plot. However, uh, we can also decode the category of apple, uh, but the key point here is that the decoding peak slight, slightly later for the apple as compared to the decoding of lion, right? So we have this sequential element of supposedly decoding being done by the anterior temporal lobe. So this is still early days, but you can probably see where, where this is going. Um, and um, what we want to do is to continue this work and also relate this decoding to brain oscillations. And I'll explain you more later why we, we want to do this. So what I've told you so far uh, were data uh, pertaining to post-processing in which you fixate on a word and at the same time are still keeping on the processing of the previous word. So I'm now going to tell you more about uh, a study where we have been investigating previewing a peripheral processing. And um, the idea here is, of course, when in this case you fixate on the word brown, uh, there's some previewing a peripheral processing of the next word, or in this case, fox. So now it turns out that in literature on reading, there's a big debate on how much is being uh, previewed or, 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 or sort of processed in the paraphobia, right? So in this case, Fox is it just sort of a blur of letters you see out there so you can move your eyes to it, or do you actually uh, process Fox at the word form, the orthographic level, or is there even a semantic uh, lookup or, of, of, or a lexical lookup of that word Fox, or, even, or is there even processing at the semantic level? So people have been investigating this with, with eye tracking, but not uh, using uh, neuroimaging methods. And that is what we have been doing. So I'm going to show you a study now. It's spearheaded by Yali Pan. Uh, and what we have been doing is to, in this case, find evidence for parafoveal processing at the lexical level. So this is the key finding. Um, and I'll explain the details in a minute, but the key finding is that we can actually show that FOX is being, is being processed 
um, at the lexical level. So basically, we have uh, uh, the, the target word here. So what we call pre-target is brown, and target word is fox. And what we can manipulate is the lexical frequency of the target word. And it turns out that when we manipulate this, there's more previewing allocated to uh, 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 low frequency word, words that are quite rare. So how did we get to this? Well, um, what we have been doing is to conduct a study using MEG, where people are reading natural sentences, and then we track their eyes, of course, with an eye tracker. And what you have here is the behavioral data from that study. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned before, we have a target word that can be high and low frequency. So the first sentence is, I felt quite bleak after, right? So bleak is a low frequency word, is quite rare. Another sentence being presented is, I felt quite weird after. So weird is a high frequency word, right? So it is quite common. What we now can do with the eye tracker is to investigate how much people linger on these different words. And lo and behold, for a low frequency word, there's a blue bar here uh, reflecting, e for instance, uh, the, how much you fixate on, on bleak. Then it turns out that you fixate longer on a low frequency word than a high frequency word. So this is all news, old news, and this, uh, this is well established within the le reading literature. And there's probably no big surprise here that, that you sort of linger longer on, on, on more uncommon words. So uh, what we also did was to look at how much do people linger or fixate on the pre-target word uh, with respect to the lexicality of the target word. And the finding here is there's, there's no difference, right? So if there's a difficult word coming up in the periphobia, it doesn't impact how long you fixate on the word in the phobia. And this is also um, a, a very established finding from the, eye, uh, for, for, from the reading literature using eye trackers. And what this finding has been uh, used to do is to uh, make the argument that there's no previewing at the lexical level, right? So we now have evidence for there actually is uh, previewing at the lexical level. And we have been able to obtain this with MEG and using a technique we call rapid invis invisible frequency tagging. So um, what we have been doing is to develop a new tool we can use toge together with MEG and it's based on using this ProPix, ProPix projector. So it has a refresh rate of 1440 hertz. That, so that means that we can drive uh, the frequency of each individual pixel uh, on the screen at uh, whatever frequency we want. So what we are doing is that we are presented visual stimuli and we are flickering some of these stimuli uh, at, at, at high frequency above 50 hertz. At the same time, we are using an eye tracker to measure the eye position and then we are also measuring the, the brain activity with MEG. So you're probably familiar with uh, uh, sort of conventional frequency tagging in which you are flickering one object at a given frequency and then um, you can detect the luminance or of, of, of that object, and at the same time, you can then measure the brain response. So what we have been doing here is to flicker between 50 and 100 hertz. And it turns out that uh, we have studies demonstrating that the brain can uh, follow this uh, flicker, and we get a robust flicker response up to about 80 hertz, right? So in this study here, we have been doing flickering at 60 hertz. Um, and uh, we have also studies demonstrating that um, if we manipulate covert attention, like spatial attention, uh, we get a stronger response when you allocate attention to an object as compared to when you do not allocate attention to that object, right? So in other words, this flicker, this frequency tagging is reflecting the neuronal excitability of early visual cortex. And we can use this as a new tool, this innovation we can use as a new tool for investigating the brain response uh, during reading and visual exploration. So uh, what we have been doing is to uh, take our sentences I explained before. So we have sentences where we have um, high and low frequency words, but the manipulation here is that we are flickering these words at 60 hertz. Um, so I should also mention that this flicker is so fast that it's um, invisible, right? So it not, does not uh, uh, disturb the percept as 
you do with conventional frequency tagging, where you, for instance, go at 50 hertz and get this really big, annoying flicker. This rapid frequency tagging is, is, is mainly invisible. Uh, furthermore, of course, since we are going at 60 hertz, we are not messing around with the lower frequency oscillations, and we can also measure the uh, response to the flicker with a relatively fast time course. Okay, so the, the idea here is that we are, we are um, putting this flicker on the uh, uh, target word, and then what we will be investigating is the response to that flicker while people are fixating on the pre-target word. And uh, this is what we see in the data. So the topography you see here is the flicker response, and we see this over uh, the, the posterior regions, uh, possibly visual cortex, right? So we get a very strong response to this 60 hertz flicker, even for words being presented in the periphoria. So as I mentioned, we can also study the time course of this flicker response. So this is what you see on, on this plot here. So um, the timeline here in the middle indicates the fixation on the pre-target word quite. And uh, you can see that the response, the flicker response is constrained to the 60 hertz band. So this, this, this flicker here has to reflect what is in the periphobia. So what we now can do is to compare the flicker response to high and low frequency words in the periphobia. And the key finding, as you see on the subtraction here below, is that we get a stronger response for a low frequency target word when we are fixating on the pre-target word, right? So this means that you're reading a sentence, uh, you fixate on a word, then the upcoming word, if that is a rare word, you get a stronger previewing effect as compared to whether it's a more common word, right? And this also turns out to be uh, quite robust statistically speaking. Okay, so now we have evidence for paraphorial processing at the lexical level. So this is new insight that we could not have obtained with eye tracking alone. Um, so then you might ask, is, it, is this good for something? Well, what we also have been doing is to uh, relate this um, previewing effect to reading speed, right? So this plot here shows uh, the individual subjects, so each participant is a dot. Uh, uh, on the y-axis, we have the slowness of reading or this is how much time on average the reader spent on each word, right? On the x-axis, we have the difference in the frequency tagging response between low and high frequency words, right? So what you have on the x-axis is the uh, neuronal response reflecting the periphoral processing. And now it turns out that a participant here to the left is a slow reader and does not have a big difference in the peripheral uh, processing. However, a, a person out here to the right is a fast reader, but that is also a reader that is really doing the previewing at the lexical level, right? So what we can argue here is that fast readers are also the readers who are doing more uh, peripheral processing, processing or more previewing at the lexical level. Um, so, of course, this is also an important finding if you want to eventually re relate this to reading disorders. Okay, um, so moving on. Uh, so, back to uh, this, this uh, picture here on, on the pipelining. So, this couple is doing the dishes. Uh, so, of course, it's important to get the timing right, right? So, um, when the girl here is uh, done washing a plate and pass it on to the guy, he better be uh, done drying the plate he's at and stack it, otherwise uh, there will be a problem, right? So it's just to say that this pipelining mechanism requires um, timing, right? So how do we get this timing of the processes in the brain? And what we have been proposing is that uh, alpha oscillations might be important for doing this, right? So, so to be more explicit about the timing required when doing uh, reading, well, of course, uh, these words jumped has to be shifted down the visual hierarchy. Um, and when there's a shift down from the uh, visual word form area to the occipital gyrus, then uh, the next word over can be processed, right? Um, so uh, that timing needs to be in order 
but there also needs to be communication between the different levels in the hierarchy, and that communication also needs to be strictly timed uh, in, 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 in this hierarchy. So how is that achieved? Well, what we have been hypothesizing is that alpha oscillations might be doing this. So um, our, the, uh, this, this, this uh, figure is quite complex, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. But uh, this is to explain what we think alpha oscillations are doing for this uh, timing. So again, uh, consider this example where you are exploring this image. Your eyes are moving from the boy to the woman to the dog. Uh, now consider that you are fixating on the woman, right? So um, what we now can look at is the processing in V4, the, the feature processing of the woman. Uh, so what we assume is that there's alpha oscillations in V4, uh, and these alpha oscillations are inhibitory in nature, right? So there's quite some work now demonstrating that alpha oscillations um, are reflecting pulsed inhibition. So that means that when you are at the peak of these alpha oscillations, uh, the neurons are silenced. They're simply inhibited. But as the alpha oscillations ramp down, the most excitable representations can start to activate. And a little later, the second most excitable representations and so forth, right? So this is exactly, is exactly what we think is going on in, in V4 in this case. So the woman, you fixate on her, so the features uh, are, are the neurons representing the features are the most excitable. So they are the ones overcoming this alpha inhibition the earliest. And slightly later, the um, neurons representing the features of the dog can then activate, right? So you get this sequential activation, first the woman and then the dog. Um, and furthermore, these representations are, encoding, are encoded at the face of these alpha oscillations, right? So here we can think about a a uh, phase code organized by the alpha oscillations. So that's one key point. Um, when we now look at what's going on in object selective uh, cortex doing, say, more uh, category processing, uh, then uh, exactly the same is going on, but slightly shifted, right? So the neurons coding for the woman activate first and slightly later for the dog, right? So what we then need to require is that the oscillations in the object selective cortex are slightly shifted with respect to the oscillations in V4. So this is directly testable. Um, so another key point here is that also the saccade needs to be uh, clocked by the alpha oscillations. Uh, the issue being that uh, the eyes are moving around. Um, however, we would like uh, the visual information coming in such that it's timed with the excitatory phase of the alpha oscillations. And the way to achieve this is to assume that your saccades are locked to the phase of the ongoing oscillations. That's another prediction we can test. So uh, when it comes to uh, reading of words, natural reading, we think a very similar mechanism is going on, right? So in this case, just consider the example where you're fixating on jumped. Uh, jumped is being processed first for orthography in the visual word form area, and say later in the interior timbal lobe uh, for semantics. Uh, so what we now assume is that the representation of jumps are inhibited at the peak of the alpha oscillations. So you make a saccade on jumped, the visual information comes in to the visual word form area. Initially, you don't get firing of the neurons because they're inhibited by the alpha peak, but as the alpha oscillations ramp down, jump will excite, fire, and slightly later representations for over, right? So again, you get this phase code along the alpha oscillations, um, and the same occurs further down in the visual hierarchy, but shifted over. And also during reading, we have to assume that the saccades are locked to the phase of the alpha oscillations. Okay, um, some evidence for this. Well, uh, first of all, you might say, hey, wait a minute, isn't it such that alpha oscillations are suppressed during visual processing? And I will argue, well, that's not the case. And it is indeed so that alpha oscillations um, are suppressed with respect to a baseline during visual processing, right? But when we look at the alpha oscillations during reading, for instance, we actually see that they are the strongest peak in the power spectrum. And this is shown by this plot here. So uh, this is a uh, time frequency representation locked to circuit onset. So that's what you have on uh, uh, time x-axis here. So time zero is a circuit onset. On the y-axis, we have frequency. 
And what you should appreciate here is that we have strong alpha power during reading, right? So this does open up the possibility that these alpha oscillations can be involved in clogging the processing in the visual system. Um, so we had the big questions, are saccades locked to the face of ongoing alpha oscillations? And in, in order to investigate this, we need to look at these oscillations as recorded by MEG, and then the signal from the eye tracker uh, reflecting the position of the eyes. And what we want to do is to relate the onset of these uh, saccades to the phase of these ongoing oscillations. And the way to think about this is that we have a trace here, uh, where, and we are measuring the posi position of the eyes. Uh, there is, uh, the eyes are moving here, fixating uh, to the target word weird in this case. So what we want to investigate is the alpha oscillations prior to the eyes fixating on the word weird, the pre-target interval, right? So what we simply do is that we cut out the snippets of data uh, prior to the fixation uh, on each target, and we then we re relate it to the ongoing brain activity. So this is uh, for one snippet of data, a second and, and, and a third, right? So what we now can derive is the phase of the alpha oscillations before the target. Um, and uh, then we can align these traces and look at the phases uh, for these individual trials and then use a measure of phase locking, like the phase locking index, right? And that would then uh, signify to what extent our saccades are locked to the phase of the alpha oscillations. And when we do this, we find something quite striking. Uh, so uh, what you see here is a measure of this phase locking. At time zero, time zero is the fixation, uh, or the, I should say it's a saccade onset uh, towards the uh, 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 target word and the color code indicate the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the phase locking. And uh, what we see here constrained to the alpha band is phase locking uh, with respect to the saccade onset. And there are another issue here, and that is that we see this phase locking stronger when you are saccading towards a low frequency compared to a high frequency word, right? So when it's gonna get tough for the visual system and there's a low frequency word coming up, that is in particular when the saccades are becoming locked to the face of the ongoing alpha oscillations. So this is also something we are quite excited about because this is directly linking the alpha oscillations to visual motor integration, right? You're probably aware that the alpha oscillations have been considered very much as a rhythm of the visual system, but what this here also suggests that the alpha oscillations are tightly linked to the motor system and could be involved in linking the visual motor processing. So uh, we can also localize the effect uh, of this phase locking and it is in Broadman area seven. So that is a parietal area involved in, um, in, in that has been shown to be involved in coordination of saccades. So all well and good here. Okay, um, so I'm going to finish by explaining about a few future directions we are going to take. Um, so um, what we're also very excited about, like many others, is these models uh, of the ventral stream, the deep neural networks, or the convolutional neural networks. Um, you're probably all aware that these models have proven very powerful in explaining the visual representations uh, in, 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 in the ventral stream. And there's quite some similarities between the deep neural networks and, 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 and the dynamics, if you will, in the ventral stream. There's also some debate to this, but in general, uh, there, there, there's, there's um, a, a good accordance. However, one issue about these deep, deep neural networks are that they typically do not take real time into account, right? Furthermore, these deep neural networks do not uh, um, incorporate oscillatory dynamics. And this is something we are playing around with now. So uh, we have uh, playing with this, developing a, a very simple network in which in the, in the individual units, we are taking time into account, right? So there's realistic temporal dynamics of the individual neurons, uh, individual uh, units in this, this network that then we can relate to the brain activity recorded by MEG or from the monkey recordings. Furthermore, what we're also doing, we are imposing alpha oscillations uh, on, on, on this network. So we are imposing these inhibitory alpha oscillations. 
and then we can relate it to uh, our MAG recordings. So we have, we have done a very simple implementation here, and the basic idea is that we have been cheating this network to recognize T, E, and A's, and there's translational invariance, so no matter where the T is, it can be recognized by the network. The issue being that if you're presenting T and E, we are getting some sort of congestion, right? Um, but what we would like the network to do is to exhibit this pipelining dynamics such that T is being activated slightly before E. And that we can actually get when we are uh, putting these inhibitory alpha oscillations on the network. So here's an, a simulation where we have been doing this. So basically the dotted line here is the alpha oscillations. Um, and then the blue line here represents the T activating, uh, no, the, the, yes, the, the T activating at the out, no, that's the green line, right? The uh, T activating at the output unit, and uh, the E is the, 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 the purple line here is E activating. And what you should appreciate here on the face of the alpha cycle, we first have T activating and then E, right? So this is exactly what we would require for the pipelining mechanism. So in other words, the alpha oscillations, the inhibitory alpha oscillations can generate a temporal code in which something being presented in parallel is converted into a sequential code. So of course, this is still very early days, so this is very primitive. So we want to extend, extend this network with, with more layers so we can represent before and IT and so forth. Uh, so, so that's one development we want to do in the future, but of course, we also want to do, uh, do this with more complex stimuli. But this is just to give you a taste of where we want to take this. And then of course, eventually we want to relate the dynamics of this network to what we observe with MED and what has been reported in, in monkey data. Um, I should also say in terms of translation, we have plans to, to take uh, what we learn about reading and then apply that in children. So what I mentioned before is that this previewing seems to be very important for our ability to read and our reading speed. So what we want to ask is that at what stage in development do children learn to do this previewing? And furthermore, can the lack of previewing also be uh, explainable uh, can that explain why some children might have problems uh, reading efficiently? Okay, so of course, when doing this in MEG, we have a problem because the MEG system is too big, so that the kids, they are just bobbing around within the MEG helmet. So what we want to do is to develop a pediatric MEG, and we are well on the way to doing that. Um, so this is at the CHPH in Birmingham, where we now have installed a shielded room to set up an OPM MEG system. So you might all have heard about these OPM sensors. So they are sensors that can measure the magnetic field just as squids. However, they, they do not need to be cooled by liquid helium. So that means that we now can make uh, helmets that can be adapted to the size of the, in the individual heads, and in this case, children. And that would then allow us to, to investigate reading uh, in children uh, so we are developing our own sensors, as you can see here to the right, but we are also buying some commercial sensors to move faster on this pediatric MEG system. Okay, so I'll finish here by summarizing. So um, I've put forward, from a theoretical point of view, a pipelining mechanism. Uh, so this pipelining mechanism is supposed to support uh, the fast visual processing. Again, we only have 250 milliseconds for each circuit to process what we fixate on, but also what is in the paraphobia. And we think a pipelining mechanism can support this. Crucially, timing is needed for this pipelining. We think alpha oscillations might be uh, key here. I showed you some evidence. So we, have, we think we have evidence at least for sort of parallel processing at different levels in the visual hierarchy. That's what we showed with the multivariate pattern analysis using this new technique of rapid frequency tagging. Uh, we have been able to find evidence for paraphobial processing at the lexical level. This is also to us reflecting a pipelining mechanism. And furthermore, we have been able to show that saccade during reading happens to be locked to the face of alpha oscillations. And in the future, of course, we want to further investigate how alpha oscillations are important for coordination of visual processing in the ventral stream. We are also implementing deep neural networks that can reflect that dynamics. And finally, our long-term goal is to develop a pediatric MED system so we can do the translation and investigate reading in children. 
So I'll finish here. Um, I should, uh, before I finish, I should say we have an assistant professor uh, position opening at the Center for Human Brain Health. If you're interested, uh, come and ask me about it. Um, but I'll end here by uh, thanking my research group that make it fun and interesting to come to work at the CHB8 every day. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, that's on. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jensen. What an incredible talk. We're running a little short on time, but if you want to upweight your questions or the questions in the app, please do so. We're going to just take two quick ones, if that's okay. Um, the first one is uh, that has the most kind of votes is uh, what is the evidence that a region can only process one word at a time? Can you say that again? What is the evidence that a region can only process one word at a time? So that there, there's only this kind of one, the flow of one word through that region at a time during the processing stream or during the pipeline. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, so, so it's somehow a difficult issue, right? In a sense that um, what we want to find evidence for is this pipeline lining mechanism. There's the sequential processing of the words. So this is where we are at the theoretical level. Um, and we don't have the evidence yet for that it's possible to only process one word at a time. But I showed you the multivariate data, and that's where we're going to take that next, right? So we, we want to show that the decoding traces for word one and word two are not overlapping, but coordinated by alpha phase. So it's a good question. We are not there, there yet, but consider this as a theoretical framework that we are uh, investigating. One more quick question. Uh, one question that people, many people upvoted says, do you know what happens when we train fast reading techniques, e.g. decreasing the number of saccades to increase paraphobial processing? Um, we don't know, but it's something we now can investigate. Uh, so the thing is that um, before we have not had a tool for investigating paraphobial processing at the neur neuronal level, and that is something uh, we, we, we now have. So, so there's different things we need to look into. So we need to look at paraphobial processing uh, uh, in terms of orthography, lexicality, as I showed you here, but also semantic processing. And these are all studies we currently are, are, are doing. And then, of course, then we can relate um, uh, efficient readers. We can ask efficient readers um, which kind of paraphobial processing is most important. And then we can start to also entertain training techniques where uh, people are trained on paraphobial processing to ask if we then can speed up the, the, the reading speed. All right, I think we're gonna stop there. Um, but thank you very much, Dr. Jensen, for a fabulous talk, uh, really insightful work. And uh, everyone else, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.